And so continuing the process with this episode, um, I will be trying to take a, um, an extension on the Medium post called Understanding the Blue Church. So this is an effort to see if the visual medium can help uh, extend or enhance that particular Medium post. Um, I don't actually know whether or not it would be more beneficial for someone to have read that first, to watch this and then read it, or to maybe watch this, or possibly to engage with neither. Um, so here's the, the proposition. Uh, when, I, when I use the, the phrase or the concept of the blue church, there's a handful of distinctions that I feel are important to make first that I noticed um, the lack of them, I think, seemed to leave some people confused. Uh, so first and foremost, um, I am not in any normal sense talking about anything like a church. Right? We're, not, we're not talking about the Catholic Church or the Episcopalian Church or big buildings with crosses on top and whatnot. Um, it is a, a metaphor, and I think it's a useful metaphor because there are churchly things uh, involved with this, this object, the blue church. Um, second, um, while, while it is the case that you can identify certain actual things, like, say, Harvard or the New York Times, that are part of something that could be called the Blue Church, um, I think it's actually much more interesting, important, and useful to perceive this thing, uh, this thing I'm calling the Blue Church, from the perspective of an abstraction, from the perspective of a fundamental way of going about doing certain kinds of things in social space that was developed in a certain time frame that I'll talk about in a moment under certain conditions um, and that happens to have been um, embodied in certain institutions that we can physically touch or at least talk about, um, but they're not actually the key. So for example, I would say that there is uh, some variant on the blue church in most of the Western civilizations. Um, and they are different institutional structures, and, and they in fact behave differently because they have different path dependency on how they got here. So the second distinction is to try to separate the, the things that we are familiar with from what I think is the more fundamental characteristics of how this particular process came to be and how it operates. And then the third is to make a distinction between the form, the blue church, and the content, what uh, I call the blue faith. Um, now again, it, it, it is the case that there is a linkage, which is why it's useful to even talk about them both as being blue, um, between the blue faith and the blue church, and the color blue, because both are broadly right now in the United States uh, associated with uh, the left and with the Democratic Party. Um, but all of those can and should be also decomposed and separated. So isolating the blue faith from the blue church, I think is useful and helpful. Uh, and I haven't actually spent an enormous amount of time digging into the specific characteristics of the blue faith and how it came to be. Uh, I could sort of broad brush say that it seems to be showing up as the consequence of the long development of a number of different things that were more or less kind of categorized as the new left back four or six decades ago and how they come to show up now. But, you know, that's a broad brush. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the form, the, 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 the blue church itself. Okay, so, so given that, let me, let me go deeper. What, what do I mean? Uh, the, the, the big picture concept is to say that in society, which is to say in human structures that are much larger than the kinds of Aboriginal social arrangements that we developed in, you know, millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, in the kinds of things that emerged at scale after the development of agricultural civilizations, so societies, in societies, um, we need some way to go about getting this mass of people to coordinate, to be on the same page, to be able to make choices together. Um, and to undertake actions in a coordinated fashion. And that this way, I'm going to call this a social control structure. And I don't mean anything particularly uh, 
malevolent about that. I don't mean control in the sense necessarily of tyranny, although it certainly can be tyrannical, but more in the cybernetic sense or even in the, uh, the steam engine sense. I mean, it's just a, a necessary mechanism to get a bunch of disparate kinds of elements to work together well. Um, and that these social control structures uh, evolve or develop under certain kinds of social conditions. So, for example, the uh, Victorian era social control structure um, grew up in the middle of the 19th century under the context of the significant increase in population that had been delivered by the, that particular agricultural revolution, um, by the new urbanization, by the emergence of industrial technology, um, and by the changes in human mobilization that were brought about by the railroad, and by the early emergence of the telegraph. Uh, which changed the way that we could communicate. And of course, even the newspaper, which also changed the way we could communicate. So these are all characteristics of the social environment that gave rise to certain possibilities and certain necessities uh, that uh, any social control structure would have to uh, deal with. Um, and over time, as certain experiments were tried and different approaches were uh, endeavored, a particular collection that I will call the, the Victorian era structure came into being and, it, and it, you know, it worked for a while. And then in the early part of the 20th century, uh, the situation had changed and that particular control structure uh, broke down. And we saw in the middle of the 20th century, the emergence of a new social control structure. And that is what I'm calling the blue church. So here we saw again, a significant change across the entire social field. Again, a massive increase in population. Uh, a significant shift in the way that people lived, the suburban diaspora, for example, um, massive changes in transportation, uh, the ability to travel by aircraft or car really changed the cosmopolitanism of individual human beings, um, and the massification of both uh, production processes and, I think most importantly, uh, communications. So the emergence of uh, mass media most notably television. And so we might say that the blue church is uh, the consequence of what happens when you endeavor to generate a social control structure in that context. And specifically, we might say that the blue church is how one goes about doing social control in the context of broadcast. Uh, so now I'm making a bit of a shift and I'm focusing on what I think is the main point. Um, the blue church is quite characteristically broadcast and you might even say that broadcast will tend to show up as something like the Blue Church. So what does that mean? Uh, so first, broadcast is a, a mode of communication where you have a strong asymmetry between the signaler, the communicator, the expressor, um, and the audience, meaning both that there may be a small number of signalers, like say one, and a potentially very large number of, of audience, maybe everyone. Um, I think radio or television, where one television show, like say um, uh, the Super Bowl, might have hundreds of millions of viewers and only a very small number of people who are actually uh, in charge of what's being broadcast. It also has um, a singular direction, which is that the signal goes from the signaler to the receiver, and there's very, very little going back. Right? So it's largely one way. So the, the mental image of, of broadcast television works, and it's important. Um, but it's not exclusive. You know, if, if you take a look at, for example, the way that, that the education system, at least in the United States, shows up in that same time frame, it is also a broadcast. Right? You have a, a professor who sits at the front. There's only one or maybe two. Uh, there's a, some large number of students, and the professor is in charge of speaking, and the students are responsible for listening, and there's very little back channel. Right? So it's still a broadcast typology. And the proposition that I'm making is that this, this nature of broadcast typology, one, is characteristic up and down across the Blue Church, and therefore becomes one of the primary characteristics to look at. Um, and two, has uh, implications. It has implications in terms of what kinds of things are said, how power shows up and plays with the constraints of how broadcast operates, and also in terms of what the underlying uh, consciousness and psychological uh, characteristics of human beings are that happen to develop in this environment. Um, so we'll get to that actually in a little, in a little bit. Uh, and remember, this is not a, an effort to disparage 
either broadcast or the Blue Church. It's a diagnosis to describe something that seems to have simply been the case, a phenomenon. And in fact, it, it, it worked really well, right? If we take a look at the, at the scope of what civilization was able to accomplish in the 20th century, it was broadly, astoundingly awesome. Uh, the the well-being of human beings went up enormously uh, across the board um, in almost every location. There are all kinds of travesties as well, for sure, but that's um, just part of what happened. Uh, but the, the things like being able to go to the moon or build... You know, healthcare systems that radically improve the quality of life or the, the agricultural revolution of that century were all part and parcel of the kinds of things the Blue Church could do. And it did this by uh, generating a certain topology. So now we're into the second major point. The, the topology of the Blue Church um, seems to be defined by uh, two major characteristics. One characteristic is its organization into a, a hierarchy, as all broadcasts are want to be, even if it's just a two-layer hierarchy, the broadcaster and the signal. Uh, but in this case, it's a multi-layer hierarchy, and it's a hierarchy that in the vertical direction, you could say is a hierarchy of expertise or of legitimate and or credible authority. Um, so when it works well, the way the Blue Church operates is that in endeavors to put into place various uh, meritocratic filtering mechanisms to identify individuals and groups of individuals who have uh, the capacity for or have achieved a particular domain expertise, puts them in charge of figuring stuff out, to, of making sense of the world, and then of expressing that sense in the broadcast uh, channels. And right? so you would like to have the people who know what's going on being the ones who evaluate what's happening and then sharing that with everybody else, and that's more or less the design or at least that's the design intent, and, and it kind of works well in certain circumstances and under certain constraints. Um, of course, it has a number of relatively obvious failure conditions that will always show up in any kind of asymmetric hierarchy. Uh, so it's obvious that if you want to control something, uh, what you do is you find out the control system, and if that control system happens to have a directionality to the way that information flows, um, and it tends to have a hierarchy, then what you do is find a way to get to the top of the hierarchy. Uh, effectively, you've created a really high-quality niche, and as every evolutionary theorist would tell you, every niche is going to be filled. Um, and, of course, that sort of thing has happened and will continue to happen in anything that looks like that. Now, if you go in the downward direction, uh, you have a different set of characteristics. So if expertise and legitimate authority are on, uh, what happened on the way up, uh, on the way down, what you have is the uh, ability to be good at receiving and acting on quote-unquote good opinion. So the idea here is, uh, think about the, the student. The, the professor expresses what is to be the case, the, the lesson. The student's job is to listen, to understand, to map the meaningful components of the lesson, and then to be able to uh, respond effectively to queries, um, the content that's in the lesson. Right? So if you think it's like a math class, if the teacher says 2 plus 2 equals 4, the student's job is to hear what is 2 plus 2 and respond with 4. So this is good opinion. And we can say, by the way, that this is characteristic of the totality of content. Uh, this is part of the reason why the Blue Church is an effective control structure. Um, you know, it's very, if you imagined every single human being had their own uh, bespoke interpretation of how to drive and what various kinds of signals like red lights meant, uh, you'd have catastrophe. Uh, it's actually quite useful and necessary for us all to be on the same page about how to respond to certain signals so that we can coordinate social behavior. And again, that's the idea. So within a certain boundary conditions, uh, the idea is the Blue Church uh, enables us to have people who spend time and effort and build capability uh, processing what we were perceiving in reality, like say, what's the temperature of the, the melting point of metal, uh, and then broadcasting that down to whoever needs to receive that information, who then receives it and conveys it accurately. Um, and what's interesting is that, is that good opinion works both in relationship to up and side to side so that we can uh, police and signal each other simply, which is to say that if I express something within the boundary conditions of good opinion, then at a minimum you can know that I'm part of your structure, you can, you can know that I'm in your group. And in fact, depending on the flavor of good opinion that I express, you can even position me and know where I am in that group and can orient yourself on how to relate to me. Um, by the way, and even how to relate to me is oftentimes the content of broadcast. 
Um, and so if you watch, for example, a lot of the, the primary signaling organisms of the Blue Church, like say the New York Times, most of what they're doing is orienting the audience on how to orient themselves towards other phenomena in the world. Right? They're not actually conveying content most of the time. Mostly what they're doing is providing kind of a prefab set of evaluations of here's what the landscape looks like and here's how you ought to respond to it so that you are acting within the constraints of, of good opinion. Or, in the most positive spin, you're acting under the recommendation of wise people who've done a good job digesting this and providing the prefab way of responding to the world. Um, obviously, one can take a less generous opinion of what they're up to. Okay, so that's the second major point. So now we're just kind of into the last part, which is um, a very good way of understanding uh, what's happening now is that uh, the conditions are once again changing. And I should note that there's a, a seeming to be an acceleration, that the duration of the Victorian uh, control structure uh, was longer, maybe twice as long as the duration of the Blue Church control structure. And while it's sort of very messy to endeavor to project that onto a uh, specific curve, it nonetheless does seem to be the case that one of the consequences of the acceleration of innovation is a uh, reduction in the duration of these kinds of control structures. So that implies two things. Uh, one is that uh, the, if, the, if you say that the conditions upon which the Blue Church were was created and for which it was adapted are themselves changing, uh, then this is a lot like the changing of a niche. You know, if you, if you see the, uh, you know, the end of the Ice Age means the end of the woolly mammoth, no matter how awesome the woolly mammoth was in, in, in the snow. Um, the, the end of the broadcast age and the emergence of a new way of, at the very least, making sense of the world and coordinating our thoughts and actions uh, portends the end of the Blue Church, no matter how awesome or not awesome you think it was. So that's one, right? And, and then we can also begin to do some work on understanding what might be in the process of emerging. Okay, well, what are the characteristics of the contemporary environment? What are the things that might emerge on top of a, a symmetric uh, and interactive medium? Um, you know, that's how we can actually be thoughtful about what the future might look like. And then we have this other piece, which is that, hey, maybe in, in a process of accelerating change, might we be in a circumstance where whatever is in the process of emerging might actually be uh, doomed to a rather brief appearance. Um, you know, if the Blue Church lasted from, say, I don't know, the 1940s, 1950s, up until 2016, 2010, in that range, we're only talking about a 50, 60 year time frame. Um, so if the next thing that comes along lasts half as long, we're talking about something that, that in the historical record is basically a, just a blip. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know if that's the case, but it's, it's intriguing. Um, I noticed this is running pretty long, so I'll just drop a little a coda, and this is something that was also put into the tail end of the video. Uh, sorry, into the, into the Medium post. And that has to do with uh, what might in fact be a fundamentally problematic aspect of this entire approach to social coordination. So I mentioned that there was a, a moment before these kinds of social control systems, you know, the human aboriginal tribe or a band level sense of coordination that was what we did and how we operated for um, millions of years. And now we've been operating under a different mode uh, social control that has been figuring out how to do things and competing with itself since you know 15,000 years ago or so. Um, now there's actually some pretty interesting things that we can say about the the maximum bandwidth, the uh, maximum amount of information processing that a information processing architecture of the sort that any kind of social control system must look like. Uh, for example, anything that is hierarchical at all. Um, has actually a limit on the amount of information that it can process. And what's interesting about that is that we may have passed that limit. That the world that we currently live in, the world that exists as a consequence of the success of the Blue Church, may actually be more complex than any hierarchical social control system can manage at all. So it's not just a matter that things have changed and therefore we're in store for 
some meaningfully significant shift from the blue church model to some other kind of broadly comparable model, um, but rather that something even more fundamental has changed and that therefore we actually are now in the process of shifting, if we make the shift at all, to something that is as different from uh, civilization as civilization was from pre-civilized tribal, tribalism or the band level of coordination. Um, and, and again, we can talk about some characteristics. This thing, whatever it is, um, if it is to survive at all, must be able to cope with accelerating change, exponential technology, for example. Um, it must be able to cope with the ambient complexity of the total natural environment. Uh, and it must be able to cope with the ambient and recursive complexity of human beings ourselves. Uh, the fact that anthro complexity is different than just natural complexity. Um, and that's it. So 20 minutes. I hope this uh, is interesting.